in the, uh, the spring, late spring of 1988, I got in a car with my college friend Jeff and we headed east from Illinois to Newport, Rhode Island, a Navy officer candidate school. I had signed the papers, I had got my physical, I would passed my interviews and exams to enter into the Navy nuclear power propulsion program. The Navy even paid me money for the last few months of my college years so that I would stay in the program. And Officer Candidate School had sent me this little, here's what you need to do to get ready for Officer Candidate School brochure. But the fact is, my expectations of what would happen over the next 16 weeks were pretty far off. I really did not know what to expect. Fortunately, it did not take long for the drill instructor chief petty officer to straighten me out on my expectations. And then after 16 weeks, the Navy had another ensign. Well, last Sunday, we looked at Matthew chapter 4 verses 12 to 25, and we saw how Jesus called these four fishermen to follow him, and they left everything to follow Jesus, and, and they were committing to the, a, a new life, the life of a disciple-making disciple, a life of fishing for men, and they did. They, they, they were sold out. They left everything. They went and followed Jesus, but don't you wonder, what did they expect that life would be like? What were their expectations as they, they left the boats, they left the nets, they left their family behind, and they went to follow Jesus? Now, we know some things. We know they had heard John the Baptist preach about repentance and the kingdom. And they may have even been there when John the Baptist baptized Jesus, these four men. They had already encountered Jesus once. When, when Nathaniel was sitting under the tree, we have, we have lots of stories about how they encountered Jesus. They'd even believed that he was the Messiah. Before this, they were, they were there at the wedding. The wedding at Cana where Jesus turned the water into wine before he called them. But that day, that day on the shores of Galilee, they decided they were going to give up everything and follow him full time. At his call, they left it all behind to become his disciples, to learn of him and adopt his ways for the rest of their life. Boy, I wonder what, what they thought, what they expected that would be like. We don't know what they thought exactly that moment, but we do know that right away Jesus started to tell them what to expect. He started to tell them what they expect. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. But it's, a, it, it's the teaching of Jesus to his disciples about what they should expect as followers of Christ, the King. What is life in the kingdom of Jesus going to be like for his followers? And friends, what he teaches them about following him in their day is a lesson for us today as well. That means that if you're a Christian this morning, the Sermon on the Mount is a word from Jesus to you about what to expect if you follow Jesus. This is what following Jesus is going to be like. And I think we really, really need this word today. Because wrong expectations about what it means to follow Jesus can absolutely derail discipleship. If you have the wrong expectations, Everything could go as God planned it, but you're going to be disappointed thinking it's messed up if you have the wrong expectations. Or flip it. If you have the wrong expectations, everything could be absolutely wrong, but you'll be absolutely satisfied if you have the wrong expectations. It's pretty fitting that expectations would be important for people who are called the bride of Christ, isn't it? Think about it. How many of you had just the right expectations when you entered into marriage? Right? None of us. Okay, maybe, maybe a few of you. Maybe a few of you were awesome. But um, the bride of Christ has this same expectation problem. And that's what the Sermon on the Mount helps us with. It helps us get our disciple of Jesus expectations right by taking to heart what Jesus has to say 
starting here especially at the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Now I'm going to ask that you stand in, in honor of the words of Jesus this morning as we start reading from the first verse of Matthew 5. Seeing the crowds, he, Jesus, went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Father, we thank you for your word, for it is true, and it is good, and it is what we need. So Lord, feed us from your word this morning. God, we have, we have gathered around your table, and, and we have declared that we believe, that we believe Jesus is is our Savior, that, that His sacrifice was enough and that we are saved from our sins, Lord, and we are ready to follow Jesus. So God, use Your Word this morning to set right our expectations of what it means to follow Jesus. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. So, John the Baptist had come and he had... He had preached a repent for the kingdom of heaven is coming message, right? You need to repent to get ready for the kingdom that's coming. And Jesus then came and Jesus preached a message that said repent because the kingdom is here message. And Jesus also called disciples and he started a ministry of Bible teaching and proclaiming the gospel. We saw that last week. And it's not surprising Jesus' ministry drew a big crowd. We'd already had the water into wine, and Jesus is this incredible teacher. And there's a big crowd, but Jesus wants to deal with his disciples. So he goes to this nearby mountainside. The disciples gather around him, and the crowds are still there, but he starts teaching his disciples. He starts teaching his disciples. His disciples came to him, and he taught them. And he answers the big question as he teaches them, what can those who repent and receive the promised in the gospel, what can they expect as they follow Jesus? Jesus begins the Sermon on the Mount with a threefold answer to that question. Three expectations for those in the kingdom of Jesus. Let's look at his answer. First of all, what we see is those that repent receive the kingdom promised in the gospel can expect a sevenfold blessing befitting kingdom character. They can expect a sevenfold blessing that befits a kingdom character. Verses 3 through 9, we call them the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes. And what that means, it's a, it, it's a word that means that these seven statements are blessings. Beatitudes a form of the Latin word for being blessed. Right? Jesus is saying that the people in his kingdom have these characteristics, and because they have these characteristics, they receive these blessings. And they are blessed. Or if you want a King James, that they're blessed. Right? But either way, they're blessed. Each pair of these, though, is important. So we want to look at each pair of these characteristics and blessings, because this is what Jesus expects his, his followers to understand is that this is who his followers are, and this is what they get. They are blessed. Right? So first of all, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. First of all, notice that it's is. This is a right now blessing, isn't it? Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
They're the poor in spirit. They're the ones who see themselves as sinners, utterly unworthy of the blessings of God. That's what it is to be poor in spirit. It is to have a spirit that recognizes it doesn't deserve God's blessings. It's to be someone like the tax collector we meet in Luke 18. You remember him? There, there's the guy, he's poor in spirit, and he cries out, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. While well, the important guy stood bragging and giving his resume to God, this guy said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. He was poor in spirit. And the Bible tells us that the poor in spirit tax collector was justified. Justified, and in that very moment, he has the kingdom of heaven, is what Jesus says. Because he's poor in spirit. So as you come, poor in spirit to the Lord, you, you receive citizenship in the kingdom of heaven. That's the first blessing. The second blessing is, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Comforted. This promise is a blessing that, that, that will come later. They will be comforted, those who mourn. It isn't a right now, it comes at the end. As a matter of fact, we see that. In, in the book of Revelation, in Revelation 7, 17, those who mourn now for all the sin in the world, the sin in their life, and the consequences of sin that are all around them, those who mourn for that, there will come a day when, Revelation 7 says, the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and He will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. I mean, that's the ultimate end of this. They will be comforted. There's comforting now, but there will be perfect comfort for those who mourn. Even in the end, there will be nothing to cry about again. It will all be gone. They will be comforted because they mourn for the results of fallenness in this world now. And then in verse 5, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And again, that's a future promise. It's a promised blessing for those who have this expected kingdom character of meekness or humility. It's interesting. This is almost a direct quote by Jesus of a psalm. Psalm 37, verse 11, where it says, The meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. Those who, who are meek, those who think little of themselves now, live out their place in the kingdom in, in true humility as though they know that they are only sinners saved by grace. Those who are meek now will one day inherit authority over all the earth. We see that also in the book of Revelation. Those, those who are Christ's will one day rule with Him on the earth. It, it says so. So we know these humble saints... Now, living humble lives will one day have authority in Christ's kingdom. In verse 6, the next blessing. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. In other words, it's expected that if you're a repentant sinner and you have come to follow Jesus, you'll have a longing, a deep hunger and thirst for righteousness. You won't long for what the fallen world has to offer in your main longings. Your longings will be for righteousness. For righteousness in you and righteousness everywhere. A world shaped by conformity to the will of God starting with you. That's what you're longing for. And the promise here is that one day that longing will be satisfied. That longing will be satisfied. Isaiah 55 says the same thing. Start of Isaiah 55 says, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come and buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money, without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligent to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Isaiah is calling folks to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now here Jesus says, those who follow Him will one day know satisfaction. They will know what it is to be righteous and live in a world filled with righteousness, conformity to the will of God. 
Friends, we will live there one day if we follow Jesus. We will have satisfied our longing for righteousness. And then we get to verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Mercy, which is not being held guilty anymore. That's what mercy is. Mercy is promised to those who show mercy. In Luke 6.36, Jesus demands this behavior from everyone who would follow him. He says, be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. And here in Matthew, he says, you are merciful if you are forgiving, if you don't hold others guilty for what they've done against you, you will know the joy of receiving mercy. And for the simple reason that we still sin, we desperately need to know the joy of receiving mercy. We need to know that, that we are forgiven. And, we need, and it says that you are blessed with that as you live the life of a merciful person, which is expected of someone following Jesus. In verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. They shall see God. Pure in heart, though. Pure in heart. It, to be pure in heart, it means that, that nothing in your passions, nothing in your intellect, nothing in your will is there that doesn't belong there. There is nothing that stains your heart at all. That is what it is to be pure in heart. In other words, the followers of Jesus are made worthy of the holy hill of Psalm 24. Do you remember Psalm 24? Who shall ascend the hill of Yahweh and who shall stand in His holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully? Jesus says, if you follow me, that should be, and I think He's saying, will be you and you will one day see God. Now think about it. David in Psalm 24 is saying, who can go up that holy hill into the temple, into the holy holies where God dwells? Well, only clean hands and a pure heart. Now Jesus is saying, yeah, if you have a pure heart, you will see God. Friends, one day we will have those perfectly pure hearts if we follow Jesus. Strive to have that pure heart now. We will have that holy pure heart and we will actually see God. We will behold Him face to face. It's the promise. It's a blessing for those who follow Jesus. Now, they're expected to pursue purity of heart, but the blessing is the big deal. They'll see God. Verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. This, this promised blessing for kingdom character is the promise of adoption for those who make peace. Peacemakers receive this blessing. Those are saints who live a life devoted to reconciling men with God and reconciling men with one another. Those who follow Jesus are all about reconciliation, aren't they? I mean, the very big thing the gospel does is it fix a broken relationship between us and God. It reconciles. And as people who follow Jesus, we do that. We are about reconciliation. We're about peacemaking. We're about the mission that Jesus has actually accomplished. Those who look like the Son of God because they're all about that mission of making peace between men and God and men and men, they're going to be called sons of God. That's why Paul tells the saints in Romans 12, 18, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. And in Romans 14, 9, so then let us pursue what makes for peace and mutual upbringing. Because we are, if we're following Jesus, about the mission of peacemaking. So just think about that there's an incredible character that is expected of those following Jesus. He's teaching this to his disciples. He says, the blessing for you lies in this is who you are, and so this is what you will receive. It's easy to, to make a mistake here, though. It's easy to read this as a new set of Ten Commandments, right? I mean, 
I've heard people say, I'm right with God because I keep the Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount. Right? If you haven't, you haven't tried to share the gospel very often. Right? I, I, seriously, it's easy to read these and think this is just a new set of commandments. The thing is, while we certainly should work to develop these characteristics in us, these are the characteristics that God gives to those who follow Him. They're the characteristics and the blessings. This is the change a true disciple can expect in his life. And as God changes us, He changes us so He might bless us. That's the point of the Beatitudes. Follow me. This is who you will be. And as you are that person, these are your blessings. It's not they might be. It's never they might be. It's never they could be. It's they are or shall be. God changes us because He plans to bless us. And look at those blessings again. He promises a place in the kingdom of heaven. He promises the comfort that comes when God wipes the tears from the eyes of His children. He promises the earth when Christ returns to rule. He promises satisfied longings for righteousness. He promises mercy instead of just justice. He promises the gift of standing before the throne of God, seeing Him face to face. He promises eternal, adop eternal adoption as sons of God. And we know these are the promises of the gospel. So we know these must be the characteristics of those who receive the gospel and follow Jesus. So don't just read this as a way into the kingdom. Read this as what God does to those who repent of their sins and receive the blessing of the kingdom. He makes you this. This is who you are as a true follower of Jesus by His grace. By the Spirit's work within us, we will be those people and we will be so blessed. So blessed are Christians, us. Blessed are us. How incredible, how incredible these verses really are. It's kind of like, in an imperfect analogy, being in a math class, being given all the answers to the test before the test, trusting those answers, getting an A for writing those answers down on the test, and then getting rewarded because you got such a good score. The king who saves his people from their sins changes them to make them this kind of people and then he rewards them for being this kind of people. Blessed are us. Grace upon grace. Those who repent receive the kingdom then are, are promised in the, the kingdom promised in the gospel. They can expect this sevenfold blessing fitting their kingdom character. But we also see that those who repent and receive the, the kingdom promised in the gospel can expect the blessing of kingdom suffering. They can also expect the blessing of kingdom suffering. Verses 10 and 11 form the, the final beatitude of the series, the final blessing. But wow, it's not, you don't have to read very hard to see this blessing's a little different, isn't it? There are two big differences here. This is the first blessing that comes to those not who are something, but to those who experience something. Not to those who have a certain character or act in a certain way, but to those who experience something. This is also the first blessing where Jesus looks at his disciples and then makes it personal. Blessed are they, blessed are you. Right? See, it says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then he says, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. So the meek, mournful, poor in spirit, merciful, pure in heart, peacemaking people who long for righteousness will suffer until Jesus comes into his perfect kingdom. Until that shall is fulfilled, they will suffer. They are persecuted. 
because they chase after the righteousness of God as given in the Word of God. They are reviled and hated because they follow Jesus and they imitate His way and they pursue His causes. They are slandered to ruin their reputations and humiliate the cause of Christ. They suffer here and now. They suffer because, not in spite of, they suffer because they have repented of their sins, received the King, and trusted the good news that Jesus is the King who saves. So this is not talking at all about suffering the consequences of your own sin. This is those who give themselves to completely to Jesus suffering because they did that. This is like Joseph suffering years in prison because he refused to have an affair with his boss's wife. This is like three Hebrew boys getting tossed into a furnace for refusing to worship a false god. This is like Stephen being stoned to death as he preached the gospel. This is like a baker losing his or her business because they won't support a blasphemous wedding celebration. This is like a teacher or professor losing their job after refusing to pretend that God did not create human beings as male and female. This is like a missionary being threatened and run out of India for telling people that God so loved the world that He sent His Son to save sinners. This is you getting yelled at by an angry person who's tired of religious zealots like you trying to push your religion off on them as you offer to tell them the good news about how God will save them from hell. Those who repent and receive the kingdom promised in the gospel can expect the blessing of kingdom suffering. And take note, the blessing is once more in the present tense. Right? Just like the first beatitude, there's is the kingdom of heaven. Now, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The blessing is the kingdom of heaven for being persecuted right now. The blessing is, is current. The, 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 you, don't, you don't merit this, you suffer it, and you have the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit, in other words, are the suffering ones. The poor in spirit, because they recognize they don't deserve the blessings of God, they're the ones that are going to suffer here because they're devoted to Christ. A place in the kingdom of Jesus is the right now reward, though, for right now suffering by people who are poor in spirit in the name of Jesus. If you are following Christ and suffering for it, remember, yours is the kingdom of heaven. The many martyrs of the faith can testify that this is true today. But it seems, seems here this should be the testimony of every Christian, doesn't it? I mean, none of the other Beatitudes are Beatitudes for the exceptional Christian. They're the Beatitudes for every Christian. Every Christian should understand that those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake are the ones who receive the kingdom of heaven. And as Jesus looked at the twelve and said, blessed are you when you're reviled, when you're persecuted, and when they speak all kinds of evil against you. That should be the lot of the one who follows Jesus because the world hated him and it will hate us. So those who repent and receive the kingdom promised in the gospel can expect a sevenfold blessing befitting their kingdom character. They can expect the blessing of kingdom suffering, which is a place in the kingdom. And those who repent and receive the kingdom promised in the gospel can expect a superior eternal reward. A superior eternal reward if you repent. That final beatitude that we just looked at comes with a doozy of a blessing, doesn't it? He says... If that happens, verse 12, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The final beatitude in verses 10 and 11 is followed by verse 12, and it has the first command in the beatitudes. There haven't been any commands so far till this one. I mean, in every beatitude there is an implied 
you want to exhibit the character of a kingdom citizen, absolutely. But this is the first imperative command. Being made this way, being made a kingdom person, you must do this. It is explicit. After saying, when others revile and persecute and utter all kinds of evil against you, rejoice and be glad is the command. Rejoice and be glad. Now think about that command for a second. Even as you're hated, persecuted, bad mouthed for following Jesus, you must rejoice and be glad. Man, there, there's some, I'm going to go back to math. There is something in this verse that probably makes a reader feel like a college freshman during that first week of calculus class, right? You read this verse and you think, I understand what you say I'm supposed to do. I just don't know how to do it. I'm suffering. Rejoice and be glad. How can hating me, persecuting me, and bad-mouthing me drive me to rejoicing and gladness? Jesus answers that. It is unnatural, by the way. It is unnatural to rejoice and be glad when you're reviled, persecuted, and lied about for following Jesus. But you rejoice with gladness anyway because our reward is great in heaven. Your reward is great in heaven because that's how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We do not pursue suffering for rewards. Right? Don't go out and try to be your most Jesus offensive so that you can get rewards. That's not the point, right? That, that approach was taken by some monks in the Middle Ages. They went out and they, they lived naked in the caves because that was suffering and surely they'd get some rewards. Don't, don't just suffer. That's not the point. The point is if you're following Jesus, you will suffer for his name's sake. On his mission to glorify him, you will suffer and you rejoice and you rejoice because this suffering is temporary. This suffering is temporary and it will soon be replaced by superior eternal rewards. Jesus says that's how it worked with the prophets. In 2 Chronicles 24, Zechariah. He is stoned to death for being a man of God. Second Chronicles 26, it says the prophets are despised and mocked. Jeremiah 20, prophet Jeremiah is beaten and put into stocks. And we can go through all kinds of examples. What he's saying here is those who follow Jesus and do the work of calling others to follow Jesus will suffer will suffer. It's the way of the people of God. And he's not saying, buck up little trooper. He's not saying, don't worry, be happy. He's not saying, just grin and bear it. He's saying, if you keep your eyes on Jesus with faith, what waits for you at the end of this suffering is so absolutely glorious that you will forget the suffering altogether. That your reward is so great that you are blessed even in your suffering. It's, 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 this, is a, this is probably the worst illustration, I, but it, it's about as close as I can get. It, it, it's like an athlete. I mean, every athlete knows if you're going to be the very, very best athlete, that is only going to come through an awful lot of physical suffering, practice after practice after practice. While everybody else is playing, you're in the weight room. Everybody else is sitting in front of the TV. You're, you're, you're running laps. You're doing all this work. You're not doing it because you like the pain, unless you're weird. You're not doing it for that reason. You're doing it because you want what waits for you at the end. And Jesus is saying that that's how this is. You deal with the, the suffering. You deal with being persecuted. You deal with being bad-mouthed. You deal with being hated because you believe that what God has in store for you in His eternal kingdom is a reward that is beyond your imagination. We rest our hope in that superior eternal reward as we suffer along the way. We set our eyes on Jesus. 
by the way, because he is that reward. He is that reward. As Jesus talks about this superior reward, be careful you don't get too caught up in pearly gates and streets of gold. The point in that is that the city is such a glorious city that it can pave its streets with gold and doesn't care. It can make its gates out of pearls because pearls don't really matter a whole lot. The point of, of the glory of this reward is to be with Jesus in this place He has prepared for His people. Revelation 14.12 After an angel declares that all who worship the beast will drink the wine of God's wrath poured out full strength in the cup of His anger and be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and presence of the Lamb with the smoke of their torment going up forever and after. After describing the horrible fate of those who do not follow Jesus, he says this, Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of their God and their faith in Jesus. He's saying, look, those who don't follow Jesus suffer, but I'm calling the saints, endure. Endure the suffering now because... The very next thing he says, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. And the heavens echo, the Spirit says, blessed indeed that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Their deeds follow them. If you follow Jesus here and now and suffer for it, those deeds follow you into eternity and you are rewarded for them. I mean, heaven is all of grace. We don't deserve a seat at the table at all. We don't deserve a, a, a place in the, in, in the mansions God has prepared for those who love Him. We don't deserve any of that. Yet this says, if you follow Him and you do the things He has given you to do, you, you serve Him and you suffer for it, your deeds will follow you and you will be greatly rewarded for them in His kingdom. So as you suffer, rejoice and be glad because it's just evidence of how awesome it's going to be when Jesus comes. So what can you, you expect if you repent and receive the kingdom promised in the gospel? Well, the sevenfold blessing that goes along with your kingdom character, the blessing of kingdom suffering, but also the superior eternal reward that He promises to His people. So I ask you this morning, have you repented of your sin, been forgiven, and received a place in the kingdom? Because I mean, all of this blessed are is only for those who have. If you have not, if you have not turned away from your love of sin, repented of it, turn to Christ, receive forgiveness because of what Jesus did on the cross for you. If you have not done that, do that today. Trust in Jesus and be saved. Trust in Jesus and be saved. And if you have done that, brothers and sisters in Christ, the question for you is simple. Do the Beatitudes describe you? The answer is, if you have done that, the answer is yes, they do. So, are you obeying the one command? As you pursue righteousness in humility, meekness in this life, and you suffer for it, are you obeying the one command? Are you rejoicing and being glad? Friends, I just fear that as Christians as we suffer and are persecuted for our sake in this world, that what the world sees is us fighting back right now. And you know what? That looks to them like we're just another one of them with a different cause. What would they say if in the face of suffering we rejoiced and were glad? You want a testimony that will change the world? It's that one. Read the book of Acts. 
What did these disciples do when they were locked in prison? They started a music ministry. Right? What did they do when they were beaten and thrown out of this town? They went to the next town and did the same thing that got them beaten and thrown out of this town. And they did it with joy. They rejoiced and they were glad. So brothers and sisters in Christ, let's let the joy of the Lord and the promises of the kingdom of heaven be so great in our minds and our hearts that whatever comes, we follow Jesus and whatever comes our way, we rejoice and we are glad. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this, this message, Lord. A message from the very lips of Christ himself, our Savior. God, I pray that we would hear it and take it to heart. It is, it is, it is not an easy wor word for us, Lord, because the, the lies and the distractions of the world around us are great. And it calls us to do things that in the flesh we would never want to do. But it is a good word. It is your perfect word. It is the word we need. So help us hear it. Help us believe it. God, I pray for any who have never turned to Christ this morning. I pray that today would be the day they would be saved. And I pray for my brothers and sisters. I pray that we would know what it is like to live this kind of beatitude life. And that we would rejoice and be glad. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Todd's going to